Yan Zhao here. Tonight, special guest, Scott McCullough, author and creator of Door Kickers. How are you doing? Hey, man, I'm great. Thanks for having me. Well, I'm glad we could finally hook up. I know we tried uh, <laughs> last year uh, and things just didn't quite work out. Um, and at that time, you were just launching the Door Kickers 2 campaign. Uh, right. So how's it how's it going? Dude, it, it's you know, it did it did any it did way better than I ever had any expectations. You know, I know that, you know, there is a tendency for books to do better on their second campaigns. But, mm -hmm. and you know, with your own thing, there's always that kind of, you know, niggling of self-doubt in the back of your head that until you kind of get to certain milestones, you're just you're like, all right, are, are they going to go on this journey with me? And, you know, and sure as sure as enough, man, you know, uh, a lot of people have. And I, I've been very lucky with this campaign. All right. So. Uh... For new audience members, uh, why don't you give us a little bit of what exactly are the door kickers? Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. The concept is, is that the door kickers is a, is what you call, a, you know, a team of commandos, a special mission unit that works for a secretive part of the U.S. government that takes care of supernatural threats. And they, you know, they find, fix, and finish, you know, the bad guys that nobody wants to talk about. Um, you know, the kind of, you, you know, it's a kind of an alternative, maybe a, um, a real world take on something like Men in Black or something like that. And, you know, and rather than aliens, it, it's more um, cosmic horror, you know, Lovecraft style um, horror, uh, supernatural stuff that they deal with. Um, that said, there's a lot of elements of, you know, some of the things that have really shaped me as a kid, like Dungeons and Dragons. I was a big D&D &D guy back oh, in the cool. day. And so, you know, some of the items that they use are kind of like, how would magic items be made in the modern world if um, if they used kind of D&D methodology? So uh, there's some of that, you know, and like some of the armor, for instance, you know, their armor mm -hmm. plates our magic, you know, and, and, and until it comes up, you don't really know that. Um, but you, you know, in this episode, in this show, uh, or this not show in this book, uh, it'll come up and that, and I don't, I don't generally like to kind of just lay everything out ahead of time. Mm -hmm. I like the kind of the discovery to happen for the reader as they kind of go along that journey. So, um, so yeah, it's a, you know, special forces meets uh, Lovecraft. Uh, so, you know, uh, Door Kickers 1, uh, I recall, was one of the earlier books that came out um, sort of in that whole 2018 crowd where all of a sudden a bunch of people jumped into the indie yeah. comic scene. Um, and from what I recall, uh, it got a pretty, pretty good reviews from the people who read it. Uh, and I remember I saw you at the time you were on Sweetcast Channel uh Reg fairly regularly yeah uh, so what what was it that made you say like ah oh, yeah now's the time now i'm jumping into this business well well so so i love yeah, i love comics as a kid right but to say that i was a diehard comics fan for mm -hmm. my whole life would not be correct um you know i read comics a lot as a kid into the 80s you know i i uh in, into the early 90s, I really kind of, you know, there was a kind of a renaissance, you know, in that before mm -hmm. the image was created. And so there was a lot of great things happening at Marvel. And so that <clears throat> kept my interest despite girls and things like that competing in high school. <laughs> um, but ultimately, when I went to college, you know, my interest in comics, you know, just kind of went by the wayside. Um, I started role playing again in comp in college, so I would, you know, I I'd, oh, nice. I'd think a lot more about Warhammer 40k and and D and D than I was thinking about comics at that point. Um, but you know, my focus on comics was always there. Like I always had comics in my room, you know. Like like I brought, mm -hmm. I had like a little short box that of of like some of my favorite comics that I just brought with me, you know, to to college just just so I had things to read from time to time, and. Um, as I kind of went through school, I started, I, I had a, 
I was getting a degree in art, but I also took some writing classes. Um, and I got interested in writing, not completely separate from comics. But then um, the girl I was dating at the time, she's like, you know, you 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 don't really want to write a novel. You know, why don't you write something like a why don't you get a job writing movies or things like that? And I've always been interested in cinematography and all that kind of stuff. And I had, you, you know, some classes in that. And, and and so I was like, yeah, that's not a bad idea. I could write a write a screenplay. Um, and then through writing that screenplay, that first screenplay I wrote, you know, I kind of came back to some of my comics and and I was like, I could write comics, too. You know, that would be something and, and it would probably be easier to get a job as a comic writer than it would be as a s screenwriter. And I could do some work in comics and then eventually jump over and, and get a job writing movies, because that's really what I wanted to do as far as my writing went. And so I had some contact um, with some uh, image folks uh, in the late 90s, and I had a couple opportunities pop up with that. And, um, you know, so that started to be like a real interest of mine. And the screenwriting thing never went away either. And I, so I ended up writing three separate movie scripts, and I got, um, I got an option on one of them which was very cool. You know, it wasn't a lot of money, but it was, you know, back then to me, it was a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And um, so that kind of kept my interest. And so um, and I just kept kind of nugging away at, at writing as, as just something I did in addition to my regular work um, until 9-11 happened. And then once 9-11 happened, you know, that's when I kind of, I was in the National Guard in the 90s. And so that's when, you know, I kind of, put down a lot of other stuff and I, I got back in the military. And, and so I spent, you know, all those productive years in the two thousands um, going to countries that, you know, that They're have not. problems with things like, you know, malaria and, and sand and all that kind of stuff. So I kind of got off track, but the, you know, after being in Afghanistan, I came, I came back to writing comics and so uh, cause it, you know, the writing was always something that I would do as, you know, for fun, you know, when I had time just to kind of take my mind off of, especially on deployments and things like that. So I had like, you know, writing journals and I came up with the idea of for door kickers after my time in, um, in Afghanistan, because I, you know, like I was on the same base that they launched the raid that to, to kill bin Laden from, oh. uh, you know, zero, if you want, yeah, if we watch zero, zero dark, dark 30, 30. Yeah. they talk about, you know, uh, Jalabad airfield and that's where mm -hmm. I was at. And wow. so through, through my work there, I kind of rubbed shoulders with some of these, you know, OGA guys that means mm -hmm. other, other government agencies. So that's the euphemism for things like whether it's CIA, DIA, DEA, NSA, it, whatever, you know, you're, your flavor of spook uh, over mm -hmm. there that you just called them OGA. And so, um, you know, I, I got to know some of them, not very well, but just, you know, kind of working with them and then also working um, pretty closely with some special operations guys. And I was thinking to myself, I don't really care about this terrorism thing. I mean, that's too, I don't want to focus on the real world. I want to focus on something different. Yeah. How would these guys, and I was reading a lot of Lovecraft at the time, because, uh, you know, you could download Lovecraft for free off the Internet. So I discovered that one day and I, I was like, oh, I'm going to catch up on my Lovecraft. And so uh, I started really reading a lot of that. And I was like, well, how would, you know, how would these warriors, you know, how would they attack a problem like a cosmic horror? You know, because the whole idea of com cosmic horror that kind of differentiates it from things like Freddy and Jason and all the kind of slasher stuff is that cosmic horror is this whole idea of a of a huge threat that is almost completely unaware of you. Mm -hmm. It doesn't care. And it kills you not through, uh, you know, like, oh, I'm going to go and kill John over there. You know, it kills John because it just steps on him. It's kind of like us to ants. Right. You know, just because we don't care about the ants doesn't mean we don't see them or look at them or interact with them. But ultimately, when we kill them, we just don't care. You know, so. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, that's the kind of mm -hmm. that's that's the germ of the idea. And then uh, a, fr a friend of mine had an independent comic company. And he hit me up 
Um, and he's like, hey, um, do you have any ideas of like military style stuff? Are you still writing? Would you be in- wanting to do this? Like, yeah, I got an idea. I pitched him the idea. And so he was down. And so he published the first. So if you got the first book, there's a mm-hmm. 10 page backup story that Doug Franchin drew called Operation uh, uh, is Door Kickers Objective Breezy Dream. And um, that is the story that was a 10 page story that was put in an anthology that my friend did. And so, so he's the one that kind of got the ball rolling on door kickers. And well, he made some not so great business decisions. And so his company was no more. And, but I still had the door kicker stuff and I had, I, you know, like, so bad medicine that I, that I'm, the, the, this, the current uh, campaign bad medicine is based on, scripts that i wrote when i was back in 2015 or yeah 2015 when mm-hmm. i was working with the space scope folks and oh, so okay. yeah and so you know i i didn't think that that was the right story for the first book so i i had a different idea for the first book but the first book l- leads very well into this you know the second book and that's how that whole thing got started. And, and so I was really fortunate to be able to jump right into when I discovered Comicscape in 2018, I guess it was, you know, I was able to jump right in with both feet because I still had that that 10 page story. And so, like I used I offered that 10 page story as a free giveaway for anybody who signed up for the mailing list for the first book. So, you know, like I had it as a PDF. So if you if you. If you sent me your email, then I gave you the PDF to that. And so it was a teaser for that. And so mm-hmm. um, and people responded very well to that. And and it did well when I launched the campaign. So and and you're right, being friends with guys like uh, Sweetcast and there's, you know, uh, there's a ton of g- guys out there that were just super helpful. Uh, mm-hmm. John Malin was the first big one, big guy to have oh, yeah. me on his show. Um, you know, so I was able to, you know, kind of show people what I had and, and they liked it. And so I was, we were successful. So it was an awesome time. Um, so, you know, speaking about, um, sort of war comics, you know, there, there were a whole lot of war comics, um, sixties and seventies. And in the 80s, they really dropped off with the exception of G.I. Joe. Um, and I've always had this theory that a lot of that has to do with um, people's grandparents, or, or well, at that time it would have been people's parents, well, not parents, dads, <laughs> being in uh, World War II. And, yeah. um, you know, so therefore they had, they already had some connection to the stories. It's one reason why I think Westerns have really declined. It's when Westerns first came out in the movies, people's, grandparents were living in that era and therefore people had a connection. They could sort of connect with their grandparents. Sure. Do you sort of see like maybe a return to war comics coming up, especially with such a, a huge amount of veterans from uh, the Afghanistan through Iraq time? Well, I I'd like to say that now that the forever war is over, um, then, you know, I think I think it's easier to focus on things like that once the war is over. And for a lot of people in America, the wars are over. Um, But the problem is, and this kind of goes into my other project at the moment, my YouTube channel um, is, you know, good news. Good news is, is the forever war that lasted the last 20 years is over. The bad news is, is an even bigger war is getting ready to start. Um, And so. I'll be honest with you. I think um, I think as, assuming we can keep, you know, the world in a general, some, a, a general stable place. I think you, I think you're right. I think that there could be a, a you know resurgence of of military uh, comics just because there are a lot of military people out there that want to tell their stories. But there is also kind of this, you know, younger generation that just missed. Uh, you know, the last war and they're, you know, especially boys are hungry for, for, for those war stories. Right. Yeah. I think and, so. you know, and, and I, I think it's important to not, for them not to be too real. Like, um, mm-hmm. 
so like a lot of the World War II comics that I liked, um, you know, because I encountered them in the in the late seventies and early eighties, and also in the back issue bins in the eighties, were like the um, there was one about this like phantom tank or something like that. It was you know it was a ghost you know it was a ghost mm-hmm. tank or something. And, you know, it would show up from time to time. And, you know, they had that supernatural kind of thing to it. And, you know, and that helped that helped make it accessible because it was not too real. And that's one of the reasons why I didn't want to focus on commandos killing, you know, terrorists. Right. I, I want to focus on things that aren't quite real because, you know, it allows us to to indulge my interest in military stuff but at the same time it allows us to kind of escape reality a little bit and you know when i was in afghanistan there was a lot of reality around me and right that's that was the last thing i wanted to focus on yeah oh yeah i can see that i mean i think that's why the marvel movies blew up when they did um just because yeah, that fantasy. we didn't want like there was enough real reality we wanted heroic heroes and uh, you know, superpowers who can always make things right. Um, but you I, in the, the idealized, you know, male power yeah. fantasy. You, you know, yeah. you want you want these people who are beyond repro- reproach, rather than the kind of gritty, you know, antiheroes that were really big in the '90s, right? Yeah, yeah. The the whole grim dark thing got pretty bad by the end of the '80s and early '90s. Well, and you know, I'll be honest with you. I think the um, there is a different segment that embraced that kind of grim darkness too during, you know, the, the coming apocalypse and things like that. You know, that's the reason why, you know, I think the zombie may craze in the two thousands was mm-hmm. all about like the whole idea of this existential anxiety that people yeah. felt yet. If I focus on zombies, I can, I can talk about preparations and I can talk about potential end of the world scenarios, but I can laugh it off as me just talking about zombies, you know? Mm-hmm. So there is some psychology there that, that allows us to, through fantasy, express our real life anxieties, both as escapism, going towards things that we don't have to deal with in our regular life, but also dealing with these real problems in our regular life through things that are fantastical. Uh, so in your opinion, do you think of war stories, uh, you know, like doom kickers or like the phantom tank? Um, do you, do you mean you door think... kickers, not doom kickers? Or, sorry, door kickers, not doom, not, definitely not doom kickers. No, no, <laughs> definitely not that one. Um, sorry about that. Uh, do, do you see it see, that as was the like... problem? Doom kickers came out like six months after I started, you know, shopping door kickers. And I was mm-hmm. like, you've got to be fucking kidding me, man. I was like, it's just too close. It's yeah. one letter off. I was like, but you know, I didn't complain about it because that's not who I am. Uh, but do you think uh, war comics like this and then the Phantom Tank one, um, that there's a little bit of catharsis for the people who were over there? And also, you know, as a family guy, do you see this as in some ways a good intro to you know teach your kids about what happened it's not exactly what happened but you know maybe people are in similar kinds of situation without having to expose kids to just how bad it was yeah no i think i think there is something there i mean you you can work out so that you know like i've had experiences that while i'm not working them out directly and um you know in the pages of my comics, I'm think you know, I think about them and I think about people and I think about, you know, events, you know, both events that I took part in and I witnessed firsthand, but also events that, you know, I understand, but I was not there for, you know, um, you know, especially things like, for instance, I, when I was um, writing the first book, uh, I was when I was when I was writing all the kind of initial stuff for Door Kickers, it was 2014, and all mm-hmm. the stuff was going on in U- in the Ukraine. So 2014, then 2015 is when the war in Ukraine really started after the yeah. Maidan protests in 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 late uh, 2014, and then so um, 
you know, so I'm sitting there. I remember, you know, sitting there. Ha- I had a live stream from Donetsk that was pointed towards the airport. It was a, it was RT Russia Today had a, a on this t- tall building somewhere in Donetsk, and um, you could it was a live stream and it was literally going twenty four hours a day on YouTube, and it would have gun you could hear the gunfire and explosions from the airport that would you know was about five miles away from where this camera was, but you could hear that at the distance. So it's like literally this is the first time in in modern well in history where somebody sitting in Korea could listen to um, the sounds of a a battle live through the internet. And, you know, so that kind of, you know, uh, Mm -hmm. so I ended up basing the location of the first story in Ukraine. And I kind of, you know, if, if anybody read the book, they know, like I dropped some, some background that, one of the characters, Jigna, was actually in Ukraine during, you know, 2015 and had interacted with, you know, as a kind of a spy, you know, uh, the special operations and, and intelligence folks in Ukraine. And, you know, she was behind enemy lines. So, you know, I a lot of the things that, you know, so like, for instance, I never fought in Ukraine, but I understand mm-hmm. what those guys are going through, you know, and so I'm able to then take what I saw in Iraq and Afghanistan and then filter it through that that completely different um, conflict in Ukraine. And then I dropped my book, Door Kickers, right on top of, you know, Ukraine. So like the Door Kickers book takes place like, you know, 2018, 2019 mm-hmm. Ukraine, where, you know, they are they have essentially, you know, they're at post-conflict at that point, but still there's a lot of crazy stuff going on. And that's the kind of the, the backdrop that my fantasy world of the door kickers kind of inhabited. Does that kind of talk? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if I answered your question, but (laughs) no, you did. Um, And so, you know, speaking of uh, how locations can inform. Oh, hold hold on a second. By, By the way, it's not the, ghost tank is the haunted tank the haunted tank okay yeah it's a dc comic yeah all right i'm gonna have to look into that after um so talking about how you know ukraine itself sort of um influences the story and how you know um you can get a lot out of that uh so in door kickers bad medicine you're in brazil so how yeah what what made you say yep brazil so honestly, that's actually a very easy question to answer. My artist at the time, um, when, back in 2015, when I was originally writing the story for um, for um, uh, Bad Medicine, it was Doug Franchin. He was my Brazilian artist. He lives in Sao Paulo. Uh-huh. And so I'm like, you know what? I'm going to I could set this story anywhere in the world. I'm going to set it in Brazil because I must put it in his hometown and then he's going to be able to, cause he's a fantastic artist yeah. and it just gives him an opportunity to show off his, his home country and his hometown a little bit. And um, I, let me just tell you, I haven't really um, some of the stuff that I've already shown is great. Um, but some of the stuff that he's bringing, you know, like some local mm-hmm. landmarks and things like this, um, you know, that he's going to put in the later, chapters or the later pages of the story i mean they are really gonna you're really gonna see like if you're from brazil you're gonna see shit and you're gonna be like that is that's that whoever did this knows exactly where where this is or what they're talking about so that was one of the reasons why i did that because i wanted to bring that authenticity right um Mm -hmm. and you know i asked him a lot of questions but i also did a lot of research you know on the uh, federal Brazilian police, the the COT, which is the uh, their kind of counterterrorism uh, unit mm-hmm. there, and so you know my door kickers find themselves undercover in the beginning of the story uh, as Brazilian federal police officers on an investigation, and what they're investigating is uh, some sort of a supernatural anomaly, and you know they get there and the and the first page, you know it's kind of. It's kind of like the for the last book, you know, they're right in the middle of the investigation. So it's kind of like if you if you had a movie 
you know, like mm -hmm. you've already missed the first 20 minutes of the movie. Right. And you're, and you're yeah. walking in and, and they're investigating the scene of, a, of, of what appears to be a bomb blast in the Brazilian jungle. But, you know, if you read comics, you know, comics are paced differently than movies. Right. And yeah. so yeah. with comics, you open up on the action. And so, uh, you know, that's where you kind of jump right into the story with them. Uh, and, you know, you'll you'll get an understanding of what's happened before and what what they're going through. Uh, but that's definitely a, um, you know, a nod to kind of old school comic storytelling. You know, uh, you know, so it's so funny when I also wrote Peregrine. Um, mm -hmm. and I did that in partnership with the uh, graded point five guys. And um, there was a recent there was a recent uh critique of it and i thought it was it was it was interesting the points that he was bringing up that i didn't even realize that i was doing when i wrote it right and so uh -huh. and it and it comes exactly to this type of you know the technique of writing so i grew up on 80s comics right and yeah. 80s comics had thought balloons so you get that internal monologue mm -hmm. and then you know the more modern version of thought balloons is the captions right yeah. a lot of captions but even modern comics nowadays they don't use the captions nearly as much and you know so you know i I've, I've been really kind of the people i've talked with um you know about comic writing have really kind of shown me some more a lot of really good comics that have come out in the last you know 15 years um and it was funny how like my instinct is to use things like thought balloons and captions and things like this, but mm -hmm. I'm also influenced not to do that. And so when I wrote Peregrine, I very much wrote that as a modern type of thing. And, and the guy was said, listen, there needs to be more kind of like, you know, you need to, you, you, you know, there needs to be more explanation of what's going on. And I was like, you know what? He's kind of right there. I mean, you know, it's not that I don't do it. I mean, everything that I did, I did on purpose mm -hmm. and I would probably do it, you know, again, the same way if I had the same objective. But um, I, I'm definitely going to incorporate that criticism here on this next door kickers. book. There's going to be a, a, a feel of, you know, you're going to fo be following the, the characters, but there's also going to be this kind of you know, where, you know, the, there's explanations where, where they're needed, you know, those captions, you know, like that explains what, ha what has been happening up to now like, in the mm -hmm. beginning. And then as the story goes on, there will be some of that almost uh, third person, you know, omniscient kind of Narrator. viewpoints to explain. Yeah. Yeah. Because, because I'll be honest with you, um, you know, my, my training as a, as a, uh, prose writer because like that's i focus mostly on short fiction uh kind of stuff mm -hmm. it's very much a sh show don't tell kind of mentality you know and especially so you know my approach to that with both the first door kickers book but also uh, peregrine was like you know let the let the pictures do their job and let the dialogue do its job mm -hmm. and then you don't need anything else but I think I'm going to bring a little more into that because it's comics. You can do whatever the hell you want, right? Yeah. And I mean, I, I don't know exactly what happened with uh, reducing the thought bubbles, but I think part of that is just overall laziness in modern comics um, with that. And then, you know, the art itself can't support a story. Like if you go back to the 80s and you like, let's say you grab an X-Men comic you don't necessarily need all the dialogue. The dialogue provides like uh, the, the flavor, but you could follow along with what the basic plot was just based on the artwork. I mean, now it's just like people sitting around or people eating or something. It's, you know, so I, I don't know what happened, but for anybody who wants to write, I mean, go read 80s comics because they're so much better. The, even the crappy 80 comics are so much better than the average thing you see coming out of big two these days. Yeah, no, I think you're, I think you're spot on. I mean, you know, there's, there's so many, but it also brings up, brings to mind, there's a lot of different ways to tell great stories, right? And you don't have to follow any kind of form. And, and so, um, hey, could you hold on a second? Sure, no problem. All right, so while he's away, let's 
check, uh, take a quick look at door kickers, bad medicine, not doom kickers, door kickers. Um, so we got a lot of good stuff. Cover by Douglas Franchin. There's a cover B by Gabo Elias. Like that's, you know, I usually complain about colors, but the colors on this one, that's just awesome looking cover. Uh, ash can cover. Yeah, Farrah's Fara, Fara, amazing. Yeah, that's really, yeah, just, I don't know. I, if you ever watch my comic review videos, like guaranteed I'm going to complain about something with the color, but this looks great. Uh, well, since you're, well, actually, you know, before we move on, uh, there was one question from the audience. So Trenton asks, speaking of Afghanistan, have you heard about the giant incident? Would something like that have ever ended up in door kickers and then, or rock apes from Vietnam? But I, I've heard, I think I've heard of the rock apes from Vietnam. But I haven't heard of the giant, uh, in Afghanistan though, though I'm now I'm, I'm curious about it. Okay. Yeah, I've, I've never heard of either of them. But um, all right. So sorry. Going back to the campaign here. Why don't you uh, walk us through? Sure. Yeah. So um, so we've had three covers for the campaign. Um, mm -hmm. Only two are available right now. The third color cover by uh, Zedius, who's done a lot of a uh, lot of great stuff for a bunch of different uh, CG oh, books. Oh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that I I. I if, if I had the ability, I'd, I'd share it with you. It's a really great cover of the female character, Jigna. Um, you know, I, I had to figure out I had to do it. Like you no, know, she doesn't have a knife. She's got her gun. Oh, like, her gun. Her hand. Okay. Yeah, across. And she's got a big Brazilian flag on the front of her armor, mm -hmm. body armor. Anyway, so, um, and she's in a, like a jungle kind of background. Anyway, um, actually, I think if you go up to the, uh, you know what? If you go up to the update tab... Go scroll up. Yeah, go to the update. So that's so 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 this is the poster everybody gets. Wow. Zevius did this one as well. So this is a this is the 30k stretch go. Everyone is gonna get that poster. Um, and then if you go down, and I think you have to this one? Yeah. So oh, here we go. The, so eventually that there it is right there. Yeah, that's so very cool. Yeah, this is the third cover, but it's not available anymore. So, <laughs> oh, all right. Well, uh, eBay. Guys. Anyway, I'm proud of it. I'm proud of it. Anyway, if you, if you want to go back, um, I'll, I'll just talk you through the rest of the stuff. But, um, so the uh, Doug Franchin cover that's the kind of the movie poster cover, that's cover A. Um, and then we went with, uh, Gabo Elias, who was, uh, you know, at one point Gabo, I was talking with him to do the art for the second book. Um, but it just didn't work out. Um, and I always wanted to work with Doug anyway. So it mm -hmm. just worked out that both Doug, uh, Doug was available and Gabo was unavailable when this, uh, um, when, when the second book came around and, um, so, also, back in the old days when I was first doing door kickers with the uh, Space Goat, I did, uh, we did do a 20 page story um, with this artist, uh, Ivan Silva. And mm -hmm. if you scroll down just a little bit, I have repurposed that story into the ash can that's available with this uh, book. And so right now, the ash can has, is, we've got to the level of which it's inked, but it's not full size and, color and all that kind of stuff if we if we somehow blew up uh if you look at the stretch goals i think it's 25k or something like that or maybe 30 or something like that 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 would get that we uh let's see what does it say 20 25 30k i think it's there is it increase the size or, and quality of the ash can and color the Come yeah, thirty k. So the idea was to, you know, if we could really uh, stretch this thing out, then that would be something uh, that we would do. But for right now, it's just a standard, smaller size, un, you know, uncoated paper, you know, so that you know, mm -hmm. like an old school ash can. And so uh, that's the second book that comes 
uh, that's available. And then also we have a tier where you can get the first book. So like your chat uh, just said, um, you know, I've been really surprised how many people clearly they just they weren't around for the first campaign because a lot of people are getting both book one and book two. And then, of course, if you, you want to be a completionist, then the uh, ash can is going to be a must. I mean, um, over on um, uh, Jimmy Reyes is a uh, YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. If you guys know who Jimmy Reyes is, he's doing the inks for the for the ash can. And he's really? been inking the pages live on his on his channel. So, uh, you know, he's just killing it. Um, and so that's going to be a really good book. And, you know, I know there's a lot of people who who backed uh, the main book, but they didn't back the the uh, ash can. And they're going to really be sorry when they see how good that turns out. Oh, that sounds awesome. Jimmy's fantastic. Yeah, he's awesome, dude. Uh, all right. So um, let's start this off. If you've got someone new to the series, what uh, level would you suggest? Oop, didn't mean to do that. Uh, what level would well, you suggest that they back? I, I mean, I, I mean, I, I honestly think that that, you know, if, if you, if you've, if you've, if you've just brand new to it and you're, and you're like a, a, a newbie to comics gate and you, mm -hmm. you don't you, you don't want to spend all your money in one spot then clearly I think the book one, book two, and then get the, uh, and then use the add on feature to add the, um, uh, so like, so for instance, right here, uh, mm -hmm. door kickers two plus ash can, then you could also add the first book on, or you could go down a little bit and there's door kickers one oh, and two, two. but and I think it's cheaper if you, if, you get the, if, if you add the ash can to door kickers one and two. Oh, okay. Because I think I get a price break on that second book, but um, anyway, so um, I think I think that's the way to go if you. But if if honestly, if if you've got a little, if you've got some shekels to spend, and, and door kickers is is tickling your uh, your itch for what you like, then mm -hmm. clearly the featured perk, um, the kind of everything new is is the way to go. And if you really wanted to get, uh, if you really wanted to be a completionist, that plus adding on the first book and you will literally have everything that there is door kickers to have up to this point. And you also get a, a little piece of original art from Doug. Um, and that's actually been a, you know, I've, I've been surprised a lot of uh, folks have, have backed that. I think I changed that tier, uh, something on that tier. So the, the number backed is actually not as high as it, it really is. Oh, interesting. Uh so, uh, you know, you mentioned people, you know, you've seen more people uh, coming around. Do you see the whole indie comic scene or comic skate scene? Do you see that as um, like the pool of fans are getting bigger or is it kind of stagnant and it's just like they switch whatever, you know, uh, is kind of popular I, at the moment? I think, I, you know, so, if, you know, I'm not an expert on indie comics. Um, but I would say that I'm I'm a astute observer of what's going on in Comicsgate, mm -hmm. and for the for the for the audience for CG, I think is growing. And the one of the interesting things was is that in the in the early days of CG, it was kind of like, with a few exceptions, everybody who was a fan of Ethan's was also a Comicsgate fan. So like Ethan's mm -hmm. audience and everybody was part of Ethan's audience, and then there was all the other smaller audiences that trickled out of there. But I think now we've become a pretty big movement and people are coming into comic skate through ways other than just EVS, right? You know, people are so saw too, Mike, yeah. people saw Mike Barron on, um, on Fox news, you, you know, uh, Gabe mm -hmm. was on, uh, I think, uh, OAN or was it Newsmax or something like that. And so people are discovering, and, and usually these are, you know, people who are interested in the culture war are finding out about comic skate through ways other than just EVS's channel and and the you know the the typical you know mainstream converts to to CG right mm -hmm. um, and so I think that's very interesting and so and so what that means is that ultimately the pool is getting larger 
And I think it will continue to get larger as long as we are providing good products. Um, I think, you know, I think the regular criticism lodged by people against CG projects is not the necessarily the quality of the projects. You know, I mean, some people nitpick writing or art or things like that. But ultimately, it's the fact that, uh, you know, a good book comes out on Indiegogo and they got to wait, you know, a year to 18 months before they get it, um, which is frustrating. And, you know, I think most people in, that back CG books um, frequently, you, you're, you're kind of used to that. And, you know, you backed yeah. a book a year ago and that book comes in today. So you, you're, you've got like the steady stream of books coming in almost every month. So you kind of overlook the fact that you back a book today and you have to wait a year to get it. You know, because you've got, you got plenty of books that are coming in. But if you're like the person who just finds door kickers, and they won't, you know, like I, I run into people here at my work and that I meet through my YouTube channel who are like, oh, where can I buy your books? Well, right now, the only place you can buy my book is on Indiegogo. And oh, by the yeah. way, you have to give me your money and then not wait. And you, and you have to wait a year. Yeah. And people who aren't into our scene, you know, the whole kind of crowdfunding comic scene, that is not intuitive. And so I know a yeah. lot of guys, uh, specifically, I think, um, I think, uh, Bancroft, I think it's Bancroft who did mm -hmm. the, uh, you know, the aggregator. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. What, what's it called? CG something. Uh, is it cgnow.org or? I, I think it's CG now. Right. I think that's what it is, where he basically aggregates all the different places you can, people are selling their books um, online into one location to where you could say like, Oh, you know, like if I'm selling uh, door kickers one through my website, which eventually I will do, um, you know, you'll list that. Yeah. You, so mm -hmm. and you, like, if you want, if you want to buy downcast there, you just click on downcast and you takes you to Clint's website and, mm -hmm. you know, and then you could buy a downcast, right. <laughs> you know, so it's a yeah, yeah. alternative, right. So and I think this is a really good, this is a good evolution, right? Um, and I, I know there are other people doing other things. And, um, you know, I can't wait till I'm able to add door kickers to this list of stuff because I'm just not set up, um, you know, set up to be able to sell my book and, and do that kind of whole back end type thing at this point. But, you know, this time next year, I will be set up for that. So that's, you, you know, we all, we kind of all get there at a, at a, at a different time. Different pace, so. Yeah. 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 You know, I do see, um, the, the time it takes to fulfillment. Uh, there have been a few people who are, or were associated with CG who didn't fulfill, um, which hurts. And, yeah. um, and I do Speaking see, of doom kickers. Not... <laughs> I do also see not being able to uh, order after because, you know, in, in all fairness to people, these books are not, um, you know, comics were always like cheap throwaway entertainment, right? It was, it was pocket money basically. Right. And now, uh, you know, 25 bucks for a book is not pocket money anymore. It's like, you got, you got to think a little bit. So I can understand people's hesitancy and like, Oh, well maybe I want to wait and I want to see the reviews. You know, so that makes sense what? to me. Um, but Wait, then it's like, so, well, now you missed it. So well, one of the things, one of the things that I would counter, mm -hmm. like, you know, is that with the CG books, and I, I'm not going to say all CG books, but I'm going to say a good, a good number of CG books are super high quality books. Yeah. You know, and yeah, and they're also, premium. and when it comes to collectability i mean what do you what do you look for in collectability you're looking for exclusive high quality mm -hmm. exclusive items right yeah. so like let's say let's say you know for the sake of argument you will agree with me that door kickers the, the first door kickers book was high quality right let's just no, say oh that yeah, for, for sure for sure the if you got the white cover for door kickers you are one of a hundred there are only a hundred of those covers in the world mm -hmm. and there will only ever be a hundred of those because I'm not going to make any more of that, of that book. Now I may use that cover on something else down the line somewhere or as a piece of art somewhere, but I'm never going to make another door kickers. Number one with the white cover on it. Well, let's say you're a fan of Narwhal 
And there were a lot of fans of Narwhal when that first book came. Well, he, well, my cover B was done by Narwhal. Narwhal is, you know, he's just launched a book and he's super successful with Nosferatu. Well, there is a Narwhal cover to Door Kickers number one that has one of 200. There were only 200 of those Narwhal covers, right? And so, yeah. it, so, it, so I think if you look at all the the CG projects, that's one of the big things that that I would look for. You know, yeah, like when true. I had the opportunity, because I missed the I missed the first oppor- uh, the first chance on uh, the first Cyberfrog book, but I came back in and and he offered he had some limited numbers of the uh, the you know the the covers mm-hmm. that he reissued or reoffered. Um, and I, I didn't buy the main cyber fraud. I had money right that, then and there to buy one cover. So I bought the Salamandroid one because the Salamandroid yeah. one was, was way more rare than the cyber fraud one. That's true. And so, you know, I think if you look at CG 10, 15 years down the line, there's going to be some very, some of the stuff is going to hit. And if it's hits and there's one, let's say door kickers hits, right? Mm-hmm. You know, 10 years from now, there's a door kickers TV show. Well, how much is that one of a hundred cover for Door Kickers one going to be worth? That's true. You know, because you know, then you know, these Marvel exclusive limited covers are still over a thousand of them. There's over you know two thousand whatever. I mean, <laughs> how many? How many of any any given you know fairly limited edition uh, CG book is going to be? you know, potentially worth thousands down the line. I mean, look at, you know, yeah, some, of, some of Ethan's books in that first printing of, you know, Blood Honey are already, you know, well over a hundred bucks. Yeah, you know, you're you're not wrong, you know, and definitely in the long term, uh, you could see that because 10, 20 years from now, who knows what's going to be a cartoon, what's going to be a TV show or a movie. Well, and the, and the other part of that too is, is that, you know, and I alluded to it when I said that we're growing the pool is that we're building mm-hmm. culture here. Right. You yeah. know, one of the things that we're doing that, you know, uh, you know I, I, I am amused by the the back and forth between the different sections of the culture war, specifically, you know, watching, you know, you know, guys like neurotic kind of poo poo. Uh, EVS mm-hmm. and things like that. And I find it, you know, amusing because I watched Nerdrotic and I watch e- Ethan and I'd have to say if I had to choose, I'd probably go more towards Ethan's way of thinking. But ultimately, guys like Neurotic, they make content, they talk about the culture, but ultimately they're not making the culture, right? right. Guys like EVS, you know, he's making culture, right? Every time he makes a new comic book, that's a, that's a new story he's telling. Um, that's something that, you know that you can teach lessons to your children through potentially. Right. You know, we, you know, we, you know, he may not be writing it for that, for that purpose, you know, but that's, that's, he's adding to the culture. And so ultimately I think if, if what we do is quality and people would like it, it will get bigger. And especially there will be a point at which sometime in the future where people are going to realize that the current culture that surrounds the U S is bankrupt and we're going to need yeah. and we're going to need something to fill that void and and books like you know cg books that don't preach politics whether it's right wing or left wing they just try to be entertaining first like mike Barron says and tell good stories like the comics of old did mm-hmm. and also by the way show females and males being strong and you know moral and and having integrity and you know and actual real inclusion and diversity of not just skin features, but thought, you know, you're going to see that in our products and they're going to fill a void. Yeah. I mean, uh, I definitely think you're right. I think that's one of the main reasons why manga is so big right now. I I think that there's something more that it, that it's just being like the current fad. Um, I think it's that you can get that kind of content without the preachiness and without like what most people would consider very, strange values and i've always considered um you know culture sort of like you throw in a rock into a pond and you have the ripples go out whoever's got the biggest rock their ripples are gonna go and expand the furthest and they're gonna be the largest and they'll overwhelm other ripples from other rocks which is why sort of the u.s one of the reasons why the u.s had been very dominant from 
eh, the end of World War II on um, is because we were pumping out culture, you know? Yeah, that's soft power, right? Yeah, in the last 20 years or so, a little less, well, eh, MCU was pretty good, but, uh, you know, generally the music is less. You see more rap from other regions. You see uh, more, like how many Korean TV shows are on, are popular on Netflix and things like that. So it's definitely something is not satisfying that need anymore abroad and at home. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I'm, I'm with you there. Yeah, and, you know, it's the comic scene is very interesting to me um, that it's kind of the one, well, I shouldn't say the one, music would be two, but one of the few mediums of entertainment that, you don't have to worry about giving up control because theoretically you could do everything yourself or you can have a very small team uh, that's producing these ideas. Whereas, you know, like movies, movies are so hard because you you need hundreds of, if not a thousand people to make those. Yeah. Let me, let's, let, let's, let's face it. You can make a book, a quality book like Mm -hmm. door kickers or something along those lines for $10,000. You can make that and sell it and for ten thousand dollars, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, that's actually on the low end, but you know, surely, surely for the budgets of the, what we work within CG, I mean, you can do a lot, and then you know, it, it's great when you get a lot of money, but ultimately, you can do a lot with very little money. Mm-hmm. Um, and we do, and we prove that every day. Um, that said, you're right. Um, there are. It's kind of like a. It's all about scale, though, right? How big? Do, yeah. How much does a comic book scale? Ultimately, you know, I and I and I think the attractive uh, the attraction of some of these CG books have has been the actual physical books versus yeah. a, a, like some sort of a digital comic or something along those lines. Now, I'm not saying there isn't a market for digital comics. I think there is. Um, it's just a matter of, you know, like the the unit of issue for my book is a physical book. You know, I want somebody to put it in their hands. I want them to feel it. You know, you know the the texture of the cover is part of the experience. You know that you know breaking that kind of crease in it and seeing the signature on the inside of the front page, which is mm-hmm. you know a physical connection between myself and the person who's reading that book. Um, you know, it's little things like that are part of the whole experience, and that's what you're paying for when you pay twenty five dollars for it. 48 page comic book. Yeah, which, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it sounds like you said, I mean, it's a, that's a, that's a steep, you know, for somebody who's used to in the old days, you know, like when I was started buying comics, they were 60 cents a piece, I think. And so, yeah. you know, like you said, those old books were a lot more disposable than these premium collectibles that we're making now, you know, and when yeah. you buy a door kickers comic book, you're not just getting a door kicker's comic. You're gonna get you're gonna get a poster with it too. If you back this, everybody gets a poster, right? And if mm-hmm. if you there are other you can get cards or stickers. If you were on the mailing list and you ordered something from the mailing list, then you know it's you know these are all parts of you got other free things, right? And so you know it's not just a single <laughs> a single product. It's a it's the collection of of these you know things all kind of go together. Um, you know, so like, for instance, you may not, you may bag and board door kickers and throw it in a long box and mm-hmm. you may never see, you may not see it again for, for years, but that door kicker sticker that you get may go on your laptop and you're going to see that like every day. Time. And so, right. And so that's the, that's the ability that we have to connect with people in a, a greater way beyond just that book. Yeah, I can definitely see that. Uh, the other nice thing too is uh, I don't have to worry about uh, Amazon demanding that there's rewrites to it or you know <laughs> censoring certain words. It's in my long box. I can go fish it out anytime I want. That's exactly right. Yeah, spot on. So uh, where do you see yourself going from here? So you've got door kickers. You've done Peregrine. Um, yeah. Are you? looking to maybe branch out more or do you think you're going to continue on with the door kickers or both or well for yeah so door kick is i would like door kickers to be like a yearly thing for me and you know i think i can do that i think i can do it all myself and maintain the quality and do door kickers every year um 
I also would love to continue to do Peregrine. Um, mm-hmm. I know we've, I've been in touch with uh, the the graded point five guys, and we've got idea. We've got an idea for book two, and oh, I've already nice. started the script. I've already started the script for it. Um, and so uh, that's you. So you could say that's in progress. Um, but I think they're gonna. I think they're gonna finish fulfillment before we turn our attention back to uh, book two. And then there's a character from Peregrine called Necrosia. She's the bad guy. And mm-hmm. I've got an idea for a standalone, well, like a, a basically a spinoff for her. And right now it's a single book, but I mean, you know, where there's one book, there can always be 10, right? And so, uh, you know, I'm not writing the story to end it, but we'll see where, where you know, if Necrosia uh, goes. And, you know, I also had a, uh, another book that I was doing with another guy um, called Sidekick Island that uh, we had the we had to pull that off of Indiegogo because, you know, just it, it, the, just the, we weren't able to, to basically follow through with it at the, at that time. So uh, that's not gone forever, but it's, it's definitely on the back burner, but I'd love to come back around to that, maybe team up with some other CG folks to maybe put that out. I only have so much bandwidth, you know, in my free time to be able to, to do these books. So, um, you know, it's, um, you know, it's just one of those kind of things that I, you know, I love this writing. I love CG. Um, I, you know, I love everything about what we're doing as a community. Uh, but also, uh, I just like, I, you know, I like being back involved in comic books and so, uh, and telling these stories. So, uh, I'm going to do that as much as I have the ability to, you know, as, lo- as much as my wife will let me, because, let me tell you, she. When I told her when I told her I was doing door kickers too, she goes, "What? You're doing another one? I thought you got that out of your system." I, I know how that goes, <laughs> but uh, well, you know, hey, tell her. Well, this, you out this, of the, the the seed capital for door kickers too was my birthday money. <laughs> ah. I was like, you know, uh, hey, baby, I need some money to, you know, to, <laughs> and for all of you, if, for all of you thinking out there, aren't you the one making the money? Why is she telling you what you do with it? I mean, clearly you're, you're not married. So, yeah, yeah, that's a lot of young guys, <laughs> but they'll learn. They'll learn. Their time will come. They'll learn. Um, so uh, door kickers, bad medicine. And if you had to pick, let's say, two cg books that people should take a look at after they back door kickers uh what what books are you excited about well i i tell you um i i'm gonna go with two uh i've I've got three in my head and i'm trying to decide which two let's see let me make sure i got the titles all right i don't want to send anybody in the wrong direction so it's tough. So I would I would say Nosferatu. I've already mentioned that. I think mm. that looks great. I love Narwhal. He's very quirky. His art is quirky. Um, so it's a little different. Some it's not right for some people, but it's definitely right for me. Um, and you know, <laughs> and so I would say Nosferatu would be great. Um, and then something available right now. Let's see. Um, well, okay. So terror in the trenches just launched as well. Oh, That's yeah. another one that looks great. Um, and then I, I, I know that, uh, is, um, thin blue line still out. That's Mike Barron's book. Uh, That's a really great I don't book. Know. That's a good question. Let's see. And there's all kinds of stuff out there that's worth with this worth backing right now. So I, those two, Terror in the Trenches and Nosferatu, just dro- dropped. So they'll be out there for a while. Uh, Johnny Phantasm is another great one. Um, mm-hmm. Big fan of uh, PPP. And uh, there's just so many great books in uh, in CG these days. You know, um, oh, the giant two fisted manly tales that looks great. It's got a Michael <laughs> Golden cover on it, you know, so you can't oh, yeah, go yeah, yeah. Michael Golden was like one of my favorites um, as a kid. Uh, oh, and oh, I, I, I'm, 
I noticed, I guess it must have just dropped today, Truth, Justice, and the American Way. That's Gabe, uh, that Gabe that's Gabe's book. That that would definitely I bet that's gonna be good. Yeah, a lot of great stuff coming out. It's oh, and Mandy's got, Mandy's got hey, Mandy's got a Dale Keown cover for her new book with Jim Stone or something like that. Yeah, it's, yeah, Jim Stone. It's not it's not available yet. It's um it's it's on pre uh pre order, but man, that one looks good too. Yeah, I'm I'm still waiting for uh, Jack the Ripper Vampire Hunter. Which is uh, yeah. her book oh, with, man. Uh, that, yeah. with Peter Pete, Gilmore. Pete's art on that is just He's killing looks it. amazing. Yeah, yeah. No, that's a, and it's a... I'll be honest with you. There's so many books that I'm behind on, too, as far as I haven't had a chance to back everything I want. You know, I hope... Oh, I mean, that's the good news nowadays is that usually books are open for over a year, so you're able to kind of... Uh, you know, you know, kind Back of catch it later on. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. So that's what I end up doing. You know, um, we'll see. We'll see how much of this money I have to spend on if I have any extra money, um, <laughs> uh, which I don't anticipate at this point. Um, if I if I ever have any free money, um, I, I'm going to get in there and back some more books. I'll be honest with you. My book backing has gone down significantly in the last year. Um. You know, just because you know you got to put your money into the, into the you know, into your thing, it's kind of, I can't yeah. buy other people's comics because I have to I have to pay for mine. Yeah, 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 definitely. Well, and you know, shipping for people is it's made books a lot more expensive overall. And but hopefully, hopefully we're starting around the corner on that and. Well, and then also printing is getting more expensive too, though. Yeah. It's starting, you know, I already looked at the, I was comparing my quotes for this book with the exact same specs as the last book. And I'd say the printing costs are up at least 10%. Oh, for sure. And and that's if you can get them to schedule you in, because as a relatively small print run, it's, it's tough to get time on those, on the, on yeah. the printing presses. No, you're 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 right. I mean, it's, there's all kinds of things that we're deal that we're dealing with, but but we figure it out, you know. Definitely. All right. So I know that you've got a busy day. Any last words of wisdom? Any last thoughts about Doom Kickers Bad Medicine? You mean Door Kickers? God damn it, Door Kickers Bad Medicine. <laughs> ah, I knew I was going to do that again. I'm so sorry. I, I, it doesn't bother me, man. I I think oh. it's funny at this point. <laughs> so sorry. Or are you just trolling me? <laughs> uh, it's been a long day. I hear you, brother. I hear you on that. No, I, you know. So I would just say, um, you know, if if you think that the military stuff is up your alley, give uh, door kickers a check. Uh, it's uh, it's definitely, you know, the guns are right. The the lingo is right. If you're a if you're either a fan of military stuff or you are a prior service military person, uh, definitely the book is made for you. Um, even if you're not, I mean, you're going to be able to understand the story and you'll be able to enjoy it. It's ultimately it's an old fashioned adventure tale um, with you know just military and horror kind of aesthetics. Because um, I try to keep the 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 story relatively simple. Uh, you know, we're not we're not trying to write war and peace here. We're just writing a, a, a comic. Um, so. So, yeah, I, I would I, you know, if it's if door kickers is up your alley, please give it a give it a back. Um, you know, I know that not all uh, people have the same budget, so feel free to back at whatever level you can afford. And uh, definitely thank you for your uh, your support of this book. And thanks for having me on, brother. Um, and the last, oh, if yeah, you don't mind, I'd like to, yeah. So, like, I have a YouTube channel. It's called Writers Fix Problems. Oh, yes. And, um, and I do a weekly live stream uh, every Saturday, and we call it the Council on Future Conflict. And what we're talking about is um, hot spots in the world that focus on where the next war is going to break out, where we see this. And and I have a group of former military and experts in other areas such as economics and um, di disaster preparedness 
and we talk and most of the guys are writers. And if they haven't written a book that they've already decided they're going to. Um, and we kind of look at it from the standpoint of writers and how, like, what, what do we think is important? What's going on and how we think that the, the conflict will, will develop in the near future. So we're doing a little prognosticating um, from the standpoint of fiction writers. So um, I would encourage you guys to check it out. I know CG, I know in CG we're focused on pop culture, um, but let me tell you, the real world will intrude on you, you know, very quickly sometimes. And, you know, you know, if you want to get a, a little dose of, of uh, where the next trouble spot is uh, definitely my show would be one of, that you could do that. Um, yeah, I started out as a writing program talking about writing in general, but uh, you know, we all focus, you know, all the people in my, my circle are kind of focused on these areas. So, you know, it, we ju just kind of naturally drifted towards it. So, um, you know, ho hopefully some of your followers will come check us out, give us a subscribe, um, you know, and, and join our uh, pretty active. We, we do uh, two hour live streams um, every Saturday and um, what, we what go. Time on Saturday? Uh, it's usually 7 p.m. EST. Okay. Um, so uh, we go two hours and we've got a pretty lively uh, chat. Um, you know, we generally have about 30 people uh, live. Um, so there's a lot of people there and a very well informed chat. So we've got um, people in the chat that are sometimes uh, no more than, than some of the fo folks on our panel, but that's, you know, they do, they, they ask great questions. So um, definitely give it a look. And if you're interested in, you know, what's going on in Ukraine right now, I encourage you to go back and listen to last week's show. And, uh, you know, you, you, you're probably going to wish you hadn't listened to it in, in, a, in certain ways, but um, definitely people should be, should be aware of what's happening in the world around them and how it could affect them. Yeah. I, I haven't caught last week's show yet. However, um, I have, caught the show before and it's really good if you're interested in more like geopolitics and especially yep. what's going on outside the u.s you're going to get a lot more discussion from people who have a lot more experience in those areas than what you frankly see on uh, most major news networks yeah i mean like so one of uh, just to get, get your run out we've got a mm -hmm. you know a guy who's done business all over the world to include russia and ukraine and he brings very deep economic kind of commodities uh, mm -hmm. expertise. We've got a former CIA covert operations officer, uh, veteran of, uh, of the Cold War uh, and Afghanistan. So he's uh, he's seen it all. Um, you know, we've got a former um, Marine who is an uh, expert in um, survival and uh, preparedness and has written a series of books about that kind of stuff um i mean we've we we've got it all uh you know it's just you know a huge uh wealth of experience um in that in, in the dm uh chat for that so you should see our dm chat going uh especially the last few days it's just it's, it's you know, they're they're bringing some really amazing points and so it's looking like uh, probably russia will invade in the next two days um, probably. <laughs> um, so right well, now, I don't know if you, I don't know if, if you followed yeah. what's happened, but they, they're well, occupying yeah. the DNR and the LNR, which is the uh, Donetsk and Luhansk uh, republics. And so what that'll do is that'll put Russian forces inside the country of Ukraine, right up you know, in the occupied regions, right up against where the Rus the Ukrainian military is. And that, and what that means is that all it takes is one little incident where the Ukrainians shoot at the Russians for the Russians to just head straight into the Ukrainians. And then it's, then it's basically uh, offensive operations uh, and, a, and a real war breaking out. Um, and once it breaks out, I don't think there's anything that's going to stop it. So, um, you know, do you think that there will be one to break out or will this be more like a Georgia situation where they're just going to take, well, well I think sort of puppet I, states of those provinces. I think so. They're going to make puppet states of those two provinces, but I think uh, a bigger shooting war is going to break out, like it did in Georgia. But um, the impact is going to be much greater 
the Ukrainian military is way more prepared than the um, Georgian military was. And especially with all the modern um, anti-tank guided missiles that they have, they've been given by the U.S. and the U.K. here recently. Mm -hmm. I think what you're going to see is a lot of Russians dying um, because, you know, you always take more casualties when you're on the offense. But but then the Russians will basically pull out all the stops and you're going to see a lot of Ukrainians dying and not just the military. You're going to see civilians dying. And you're going to see a lot of video come out. Um, now, you, probably you're going to lose Internet in throughout Ukraine because mm -hmm. that's one of the things, the TTPs that uh, Russia follows. But ultimately, um, you know, the video will come out and it's going to be horrifying. And so Europe is going to have to respond to that. And and then it's just only a matter of some something stupid happening between a European nation and Russia and then all of a sudden, Russia and NATO are in a shooting war. So, I mean, that's, I don't think that's necessarily likely, but I think that that's the kind of calculus. And so what happens to the price of oil when, you know, Ukraine and Russia start shooting? Especially if we're not producing our own anymore. Well, so there's five minutes of what my show is like, uh, <laughs> except for it's not just me pontificating. It's me moderating this super uh, smart group of folks that, that, you know, uh, definitely bring a lot of wisdom and experience to this topic area. So anyway, that's what that's a little taste of what my show's like. So. All right. So anybody who's interested in um, that sort of geopolitics, definitely check out the show Saturdays, seven o'clock Eastern, around seven o'clock uh, Eastern Standard Time. Yeah. Uh, Backdoor kickers. Bad Please medicine. Do. And uh, so for anyone uh, who hasn't, you know, subscribe to this channel and <clears throat> give the videos a thumbs up. And uh, I'm not sure. I think we're going to have another guest next week. I'm not quite sure who it is yet. Um, but thanks, everyone, for stopping in tonight. Yeah, thanks so much.